Today we're going to talk about one of the last topics in this course and that is uh, C++ pointers. C++ pointers are one of those things that now you've had three to four months of experience of coding, you can start to move on to more advanced topics and the way that more efficient and useful programs are going to operate. C++ pointers and C++ classes are two tools that we just introduced in Mechanical Engineering 273. And if you're interested in trying to be a little bit more useful and have your code be more efficient and faster, these are two ways that you can organize and perform various operations, whether it's functions or it's sorting or it's organization or searching. These advanced sort of techniques can open up the door to other things. How does C++ store values? Well, we've seen beforehand that we have these identifiers, okay, these things that we get to choose and there's certain rules. For example, you can't start it with a number. You can't start it with any sort of weird or have any sort of weird symbol inside of it. You know, these types of things. And you can have underscores, of course, and you can have numbers, but if they're later on. Those identifiers are really just a way to express an address someplace in memory in which the number or the contents of that identifier are contained. So as we talked about it, we have street and there might be a bunch of houses, one house, two house, three house, so on and so forth. Okay, we might say that this is my house. So that might be the variable identifier right here, but there's an address. It might be, you know, 63 North, uh, 580 West some sort of address that you want to uh, refer to. But if you already know that address, you can just kind of refer to it as my house. This is another one that's gonna have another address. It might be 67 North, 58 West. Well, on a computer, then we have addresses. And so every byte is gonna have an address. And so this is a hexadecimal format. Okay, the computer is still gonna read it in zeros and ones, but effectively it's gonna convert this into a long list of zeros and ones. Each one of these small little digits, okay, is gonna represent four. Uh, different zeros or ones or four bits. So we're going to convert this into, well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight times four, well, 32. So it's 32 bits for the addresses. And as I said, we have the value contents. So we sometimes write it this way, where effectively we have some sort of value, okay, 103 inside an address. So maybe this box has the address of zero, X, B, F, F, so on and so forth. And then we have the identifier, which is we're going to refer to this box and the contents of that box using that identifier. Well, when we declare and initialize, we actually assign a location in memory that is going to reserve space based upon the size of whatever was declared, but it's not going to have necessarily value. Only when we initialize A does that value be placed inside that content. So over here again, we have like the identifier, okay? We've declared it as A, and it carves out a little space for A. So right here, it is gonna be a little space. We have the address, 10038. This is gonna be in decimal, but uh, it could be in hex or something else. And then we're gonna pop in 103. Now 103 right here could be an integer. If it's an integer, and if each one of these is representing one byte, well, we know then that there's going to be 32 bits in an integer. And so it may be then that it's going to carve out these four spaces, okay, to store the number 103. Or if it's a char, well, then it might only need one of these. Okay, the analogy is that sometimes people build their house on, let's say, a one acre. Sometimes they might have two acres and they have their house. And then of course down here, someone who uh, has quite a bit of property, they might have their house on land that has three acres. But you still might refer to it as the very first address or one of the blocks that that home is taking up. So if we have program declares and initializes two identifiers, we have int a is gonna be equal to four and b is gonna equal to six. We can't assume that a and b are next to each other in memory. Okay, they might be, and perhaps they often are, but we can't assume that that's the case. Why is that? Well, because there might be something already in this spot that the computer says we need to keep. So it might assign then A to be this address and B to this address right here. They could also be flipped. We can't assume that the order is gonna be in the same order that we defined it during the declaration and initialization phase, okay? 
And furthermore, we can't always assume that the addresses are going to be the same each time that you run the program. It might be possible that uh, if we're taking care of our, our memory and we're removing variables, that it might still use the same one, but we can't assume that. So in general, developers must make the assumption that the addresses are not going to be the same every single time we rerun this particular uh, sequence of, of statements. For arrays, there is something that we can assume, and that is that the locations are contiguous in memory. Okay, they're back to back. So right here, if you recall, this is how we declare a um, array. And then if you're referring to A without the brackets, well, that really just means that we're referring to the address at the very beginning, this first address right here. So yes, we can include zero if we know that it's a 1D array. All right, but it's just the memory location of the first element. And the integer, of course, inside the brackets is the offset, right? So we know that if it's A1, well, we're going to go one more from the home address. If it's two, we're going to go two from the home address. And if it's three, we're going to go three away from the home address. Effectively, this 37 plus one, 37 plus two, or 37 plus three. So pointers then, what are pointers? Well, we can define this object called a pointer that holds the memory address of another object. That's all it really is. It's not holding the integer value. It's not holding the double value. It's not holding the float. It's holding the address, this is important, of another object. So here we do. We say that we declare a pointer, right? We're gonna talk on the next slide as to the, the syntax. So we have this little special star operator right in front of the declaration. This means then that this variable is not going to hold an integer. It's going to point to the address or contain the address of that integer. So what do we have? Well, we have this term right here, or rather this line, and this is nothing new. All this is, is going to declare and initialize a to be 103. And then we've got this new line right here, which means that we assign, that's the assignment operator right there. We're going to assign this address of a into IPTR. IPTR is said to point to A. We give you the address. We don't necessarily give you the contents of that, and you have to go to that, that location and then extract out the value if you want to use it in some sort of expression. If A has the average, or sorry, the address of 10041 in memory, then IPTR is going to have the value of 10041, A's address. A itself, okay, if we go to that memory location, it's going to contain, well, 103 the value or the contents of that particular address. But IPTR, somewhere else in memory, is going to be storing the address, this 10041. So you've seen this at least before, and we call this the address of operator, this ampersand sign, and we used it in this line right here. So before we declare it right here, we initialize A, and then we set the IPTR to be the address of A. Okay, so there's two CL statements right here, just to kind of confirm, and you can put this inside your IDE, or Visual Studio, or Xcode, or whatever, and kind of confirm this. But effectively, well, we know this line very well. We've done it multiple times, and it's just going to spit out, well, A equals 103. What's new, then, is that this CL statement is going to return this right here, the address of A. Well, the address of A is some sort of location in memory. And so if we have the computer spit out the address, it's going to return a hexadecimal address of that location. And if you try this out, you'll get the same result, except that this address will be different. I don't know exactly where your computer is going to store the number 103, but the computer when I ran it and I compiled it started at this specific location inside of memory. So now the reason for using this ampersand sign, this address of, when calling functions by reference should now be a little bit more clear in the sense that if we want to be really efficient, we don't want to make a copy of a really long set of doubles or maybe a really long set of integers in an array. All we do is just give it the address of the very first element and we let the computer say, hey, you know what, if you want to check any of the numbers, go to that location and then do some offsets, uh, adding ones, twos, so on and so forth, or going back down to check out the values. It takes time to carve off memory space, and so as a result, it's better if we just want to say, go to this location, go to this home, go to this address, and extract out the information that you need to do your job. Or we often will send addresses to functions instead of the actual value of the contents, often when it's a little bit easier and faster, and we don't use up any other memory.
The other uh, operator that we discussed was this star operator called the indirection operator or the dereferencing operator. So this dereferencing operator right here, again, uh, we saw these three lines in the previous slides. And all it does then is it dereferences whatever IPTR is pointing to. It's kind of doing the inverse of the ampersand sign. So we've got this line right here. We've already seen what it does, except now we're replacing the ampersand A with IPTR. Well, IPTR is nothing more than holding the address of some other integer, in particular the integer of A. Which means then if we have the address equals to IPTR without any sort of star, we're going to get that line right there. Address is of the address from the previous slide, the address of A. It's the contents of IPTR. But if we add the dereferencing operator in this line of code right here, well, that's actually going to say, hey, go to this address and then extract out the contents of what this address is pointing to, what this pointer is pointing to. Therefore, this is going to be the same thing as A. So in terms of, say, differentiation and integration, which can do the opposite sort of process, that's what these stars and ampersand signs do with uh, variables or pointers. As a result, then, if we go to the address location, IPTR, and we dereference it, we're going to get the value in A, the value that IPTR is pointing to, rather the value of the address that IPTR is pointing to. When we see this, we need to think of the value of address IPTR. So declaring a pointer, well, you've seen it a couple times already in the previous slides. Here are the two forms. We've seen this one where we have a little star right in front of the variable name. That variable name is going to be the name of the pointer. You can have a whole bunch of pointers declared at the same time, separated by commas. And another way is that you can also put the star right here beside the data type. So the type can be anything. It can be a double, a float, a char. But know then that this pointer, this variable name, has to point to that variable type. So therefore, the variable IPTR is declared to be of type pointer to an int. And maybe DPTR is declared to be a type of pointer to double. And these terms right here would go into the variable name. And the type is going to be right here. So declaring a pointer is going to create a variable capable of holding, well, as we said, just that address. And then assignment operators for pointers. Well, we've talked about this a number of times, but it's also defined for pointers, but in a slightly unique way. The right operand, thing on the right-hand side of the assignment operator, can be any expression that evaluates to the same type as the left. So as long as the left and right-hand side are the same, the thing on the right-hand side is an, is an expression for an integer. Well, then there has to be an integer on the left-hand side. And there are some exceptions to that because if you try to cast, for example, a float into an integer, it's going to chop off all the values um, that are uh, less than one, all the decimal points to the right of the decimal point. So let's take a look at this line right here. So this first line says that everything is going to be an integer declared as an integer or a pointer to an integer. So we're all dealing with integers in this line and we're just declaring them and we're carving out space and we're allocating memory to store three things. One is an integer, one is, one is an integer, one is a pointer to an integer, and one is a pointer to an integer as well. In the second line right here, we take the address of x, and that is the address of operator, which means then that we can pop it into a pointer to an int. Why is that? Well, x is an integer, so the address of an integer can totally go in the pointer to an int. Now let's take a look at this one right here. Now that we have a pointer to an int that is defined, we can assign it, using this assignment operator, also to a pointer to an integer. Let's talk about it over here where we have a little block. So we've got x declared, we've got xp declared, and we've got ip declared. We put some sort of number inside of x right here, whatever it is. Maybe it's nothing, and in fact we don't ever declare what it is. So there's going to be something here, it's just going to be a bunch of garbage, it's going to be unknown. And then we take the address of x, that's what is right here at the very beginning, it's at the very start. There might be four bytes okay, inside this integer, well there is, and we're going to give the address to the very first one, and we're going to take that address and we're going to sign it into xp. So this is going to be some sort of hexadecimal value, but effectively it's going to be this arrow right here where it's pointing to the address. It's going to contain in this block right here the address of x. 
And then we do the same sort of thing with this assignment operator. Whatever is inside of here, well, we move it down to here. So this is going to be this 0x sort of hexadecimal address. And this could be the same thing. It's going to be pointing also to the address, the very first address of x. So let's talk about this uh, example right here. We've seen already something like this many times. We're just declaring a variable q and we're assigning it the value six. So we have a declaration and initialization in the same line. And then right here, we have a declaration and an initialization of a pointer to an int. And in particular, it's gonna be set to point to q. It's containing the address of q. So then we're gonna go through a bunch of CL statements. We'll talk about this first one right here. So see how IPTR is? Well, IPTR is this. And since IPTR is a pointer to an int, we're going to get the address, that's what this is right here, of Q. And very similar to the examples we had on the previous slide. But now if we add the dereferencing operator, so star IPTR is, well, what is it? Well, that means we go to the address that IPTR is pointing to and we extract out the values. Since IPTR is pointing to Q right here, we're going to extract out what the value of Q is, and so now we're going to have star IPTR is 6. What happens then if we increment, we pre-increment star IPTR, so this is a string, and so we're going to double uh, plus plus star IPTR. We're going to go to the location using the dereferencing operator. We're going to extract out its value, and then we're going to increment it by 1 before we do any sort of other things in this line which means then we're making Q, we're making star IPTR into not just six, but into seven. So what's Q? Well, let's go off and just print it off. And if we do Q is, well, Q, well, since Q was incremented in the previous line up here, it is going to become seven. So initially it was six right here, but now it's seven. So let's talk about this next line. IPTR is, well, we're just repeating this line right here. So this one is repeated right here. IPTR is this address right here. Sure enough, the address hasn't changed. The address is the same as this one right here because the address of Q was declared and initialized as six and it hasn't changed, but the value of Q has changed. But let's go off and do this line right here where we're actually pre-incrementing IPTR, not star IPTR, we're incrementing IPTR right here. So we take a look at this result and it now has a different address. Effectively, we've said that pointer now is not pointing to Q, it's going to point to something close to Q, but a little bit a uh, ways away. In fact, it's gonna be pointing to four integers, or rather not four integers, four bytes away from this value right here. So we've got this 378. There's a bunch of stuff right here. I'm gonna bring this up right here. 378. Okay, the very next byte is gonna have address 379. Since it's hexadecimal, the next address is gonna be 37A. Then we have 37B. And then finally, we're gonna have 37C. Which means that IPTR, was pointing to this address location right here. And then when we incremented IPTR, we were going to go one integer down the road. One integer increasing in terms of address. And since an integer is going to be using 32 bits or four bytes, we know that the very next integer possible that this computer can hold is going to be found at this address right here, 0x680f137c. So now we're incrementing, we're incrementing IPTR. We can increment Q through this dereferencing operator. And now let's go back and let's check out what IPTR is. Okay, so IPTR is, well, the value of IPTR, which is nothing more than its new address. Let's go off and see what Q is. Q is seven still, we haven't updated Q. And this last one right here is, well, let's go to the contents. We're going to use the dereferencing operator as to what IPTR is. Sure enough, it's going to be something unknown. It's going to actually be this interesting integer right here, 174581.8492, which means then in memory, we have a block and it's holding the number seven right now. 
And we've also got another block right here, and it's holding the number 1, 7, 4, 5, 8, so on and so forth, 2. And we had IPTR, first of all, point here. And then we got rid of it and had a point to this one right here by adding 1 to it. You might say that, how are we adding 1? We're, we're adding 1 integer forward in time, or forward in distance. Even though there might be... 1, 2, 3, 4 bytes inside this integer, or another way of looking at it is horizontally, they were moving forward along that road into the next IPTR. All right, well, that is in the kind of the pointer introduction, and I do want to just kind of emphasize that if you understand the principles from this lecture just based upon the slides, then you can get the questions right. There's not a homework or a lab or a project about pointers. Well, we just want to introduce this topic so that when you see it in future classes, you'll be able to understand what pointers are all about.